So um, I personally really like this idea for this series. I hope you uh, have some fun with this too. I mean, already, thank you, Laurie, for, for doing our Kairos moment with some yoga. We've done this before in the past. And it's, it's always a little interesting because I, I personally am, um, am, am quite anxious every Sunday morning. It is my greatest challenge to learn to empty myself of these worries and expectations. So, so I hope if you hear me and you hear hints of my anxieties as, as the morning begins and as, I find my, as we find ourselves participating together in this and I find myself kind of moving into these places of this, this moment together, that I hope you'll, you'll sort of look past that and you'll go, oh, that's Tom. He just hasn't emptied his bucket yet. He's still got the same stuff he brought with him, you know. And, and, and so the challenge for me, as it may be for you, when somebody stands up here and starts to do a yoga moment, and you're going like, what have I stepped into? You know, those of you who've been with us for a long time know it's everything's game for, to be present to the sacred. And uh, so we're not anxious about how we, we're not anxious about um, what might come. We're more anxious about how we might see it as the sacred moment that it is. And that's the challenge I think that Jesus was bringing to the woman at the well who had practiced and lived by this tradition for so long, generations, and Jesus was introducing something completely different. Jesus was introducing this new way of seeing the sacred in her midst or in their midst even. And so the, the, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about what it means to live with emptiness. I said last week that if you looked up the root word, and I don't know if any of you ever go back and check me out on this, you know, if you ever do a little fact checking with me. Yep, thank you, Todd does all the time. And he'll usually email me if he's like, eh, not quite, Tom. But um, if you went back and you fact checked it, you would have found that one of the root meanings of empty is, in fact, the absence of fear. Not this sort of like longing for something that I'm missing out on, not giving up stuff so that I can sort of just let go of things. Those are all aspects of emptiness, but empty at its root means the absence of fear. And if you think about that in the context of, of our lives in general, our daily lives in general, you know, just the ups and downs, the stresses, the anxieties, the things that don't go our way, the things that, that frighten us, the things that frustrate us, and then you get bigger and you talk about illnesses and just the reality of, of our mortality, of our fragility, and, our, and you know, we, we, are, we are born toward the process of the end, right? I mean, we're born toward that process of, of, of essentially fading away, of dying. It's our, it's our, it, but what we sometimes forget, again, is that's what we always are carrying in this bucket. But if we were allowed, if we were able to figure out ways to empty that bucket, we'd discover also the very fact that we're here is an amazing miracle. The very fact of this moment being gathered together in this kind of place where this kind of music reminds us of the sacred in our everyday, where these kinds of practices remind us we're in all of this together, that's sacred. We have all of these things that are below all the muck that we typically carry in our bucket. So I'm going to throw a few things at you really quickly, a couple of stories and images, and maybe a couple of thoughts about this idea of what it means to have this big bucket of nothing, this gift of nothing, as uh, Patrick McDonald wrote in that. Some of you might be familiar with the comic strip, uh, comic strip Mutts, and uh, it's a wonderful book that he wrote. So, so here's the first little story image for you. Um, a monarch was throwing a celebration and all the royalty were invited to come together. This ascetic, this sort of impoverished looking man came forward and as everybody was already seated, he began to walk into this giant hall as if he knew the place, as if he was supposed to be there. He walked with a confidence about him that even though his appearance was questionable to the setting, his confidence seemed to suggest otherwise. And so he walked forward with this confidence and sat down right next to the nobleman who was throwing this party for the monarch. Well, the nobleman looked at him and said, um, hi, hello, uh, um, we're glad you are here. Um, are you a nobleman from, a far, from another region? He didn't recognize him, and so the ascetic looked at him and said, no, 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 no. I am greater than a nobleman. 
And so he looked at him and thought, well, who could this possibly be? He said, well, are you a lord then, a, a chieftain from another region, another kingdom? And again, the ascetic looked at him and said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm greater than the lords of the various regions. Now the, this, this nobleman was getting a little antsy, a little anxious. Now the, the monarch was not there yet, and, and so perhaps this was the monarch. He had not ever met him in person, and he didn't bother to ask around. He just asked the man more directly. He said, then are you the monarch? You've come in disguise, and you're the monarch. And he said, no, no, of course not. I'm greater than the monarch. At this the nobleman was just beside himself with anger, and he looked at me and he said, no one is greater than the monarch except God. And I don't suppose you would say you are greater than God. And the, the ascetic looked at him and said, well, yes, I would. I am greater than God. And at this, the nobleman just threw in a rage. He said, that's blasphemous. Nobody is greater than God. Nothing is greater than God. And the ascetic said, yes, I am that nothing. What was it that Jesus was bringing to this moment? The, the Jews and the Samaritans had had this rich history of who God is and what God is and how you get there, Right? And now at Jacob's well with this long history and this ritualized life around this well, and Jesus comes into this moment and says, yes, but none of that matters. And then this wonderful thing begins to unfold, and we can look at it different ways. There's different levels to look at this wonderful story. But as he begins to question her and she begins to question him, she starts to say, which didn't, it comes out a little bit after where, where uh, Lori finished reading here. She says, I have this bucket. You don't have any bucket. Essentially saying, you have nothing. And Jesus says, well, but if you knew who I was or what I have, you would find something even deeper. A deeper well, so to speak. But the story continues on, and then she says, well, let me go and tell my husband. And then, she, and then Jesus says, now, nah, which husband? You know, you, you've actually had four husbands, and the fifth one you have right now is not really your husband. And she says, how would you know, essentially, how would you know these things about me? Now, you can look at this story at different levels. The first level, of course, is that it's the Gospel of John, which is a mystical gospel and somewhat of an analogous gospel. Offering his life, his teachings, is offering a whole different way of looking at it. But I think we can also see it in a very personal way, which is how we look at our own narratives. Because every encounter we have, every moment we have, every waking moment is always tied to the narratives we bring to that moment. Right? The stories we tell ourselves, the doubts we have, the frustrations or the anxieties. Our buckets are always full when we come to our moments. And this encounter begins to challenge us to think about how might that actually not be the case? If we were to empty that bucket, if we were to find that path towards emptiness, we might in fact find something deeper. But what would it be? So I want to suggest a, another story. Mark Nepo tells a wonderful story about a friend of his named Alex. He was a corporate executive. One of the things that Alex had always wanted to do was he had a bucket list, right? He'd always wanted to accomplish these certain things. He was a competitive, ambitious man. One of the things that Alex wanted to do was to climb uh, a mountain. And so he climbed one of the tallest mountains in, in, uh, in Nepal, in the Himalayas. He trained for this thing like he would train for anything else, approaching it like it was an objective. And the success of that objective will have been achieving the, uh, the goal, achieving that final, that final objective. So he trained for it. He learned. He developed all the techniques. He learned all about the equipment. He had traveled with a guide. 
And when the, the journey finally began, he was into his first day and feeling on top of the world. And as he made it into the second day and they got into higher al altitudes, Alex began to notice how much more struggle it was even for his guides. But he didn't let that phase him. He, st he said to Mark, he said that he stayed focused. He stayed focused on the end goal of this endeavor, which was to make it to the peak, 15,300 feet. But as he got higher on that second day, he began to notice how thin the air became. In spite of all the training, the air became thin. In spite of all the training, he wasn't prepared for what was around him. It was that the higher he got, the more desolate it became. By the third morning, the ground was covered with snow and ice. Most everything was dead around him. The smallest bit of tundra would peek through some of the snow. Rocks, the ground was hard like rock. He found himself just struggling with the will to keep going. He began to question, was this really worth it? Was it really worth making this long journey? All the training just to sit here and look around and see everything dead around me. Now, I identified with this when I did a cycling trip. I read this story and it reminded me of my 20th day on a 33-day cycling trip around Ireland. It was a solo trip about, 12, 15, well, about 20, almost 20 years ago. No cell phone, no GPS. I had a map and it mostly rained. And I cycled around Ireland and on this 20th day I remember thinking, how many more hills are there? And the, all that the little guidebook would say was that it would give you easy, moderate, difficult. And I looked down to see what this last day had been because I thought I would not survive this last day. And it said, easy. <laughs> and I looked at the path ahead of me and it said, difficult. And I thought, what am I doing on this journey? What is the point of just riding day after day, eight hours of riding, pull into a bed and breakfast, barely have time to, to catch your meal and maybe a Guinness and then go to sleep so you can get up the next morning at six or seven in the morning and make that trek again on tiny little two-lane roads, sheep in the middle of everything, a truck barreling down behind you wondering why you're in the middle of the road by yourself. Sheep are okay, but a guy on a bike is stupid. And, and I just wondering, what am I doing here? So I pulled into this little village that was Killybegs in the Donegal Peninsula up northwestern Ireland. And I was having my usual easy carbohydrate, me carbohydrate meal. It was uh, rice curry, chicken rice curry. And, and as I was eating that, I was looking at this book saying, yeah, the next 15 miles is difficult. And what I'd been on was easy, and it took me four hours. And I saw a bus pull in front of the restaurant. And I threw a 20 down. I don't even know how much the meal was. And I ran out the door, grabbed my bike, and I got on the bus and made the up and down roller coaster ride to the end of, uh, in, end of Donegal Peninsula to Glen Cullen Hill. And I remember thinking to myself, why was I doing this? And it didn't occur to me until like the 25th or 6th day when I decided not to do a cycling trip but to do a walking trip, a pilgrimage that was done by St. Columba where it was about a seven-mile walk, and I just walked it up and down and across this vast terrain. And I remember thinking to myself, here I am, and I'm finally realizing I'm, I'm really not that big a deal. This isn't really that big a deal. The biggest deal was suddenly recognizing that I wasn't that big a deal. Alex, when he got to this place on that third day, and he was about three-fourths, four-fifths of the way up that mountain. That late afternoon, his guides came to him and said, the weather's changing. We got to get down. And so they never got to the top of the mountain. And as he was coming down, he began thinking about this whole reality that things die. Life comes up and it goes away. It cycles in and it cycles out and it replaces itself. And in some ways, we're just a very small part of the whole big scheme. And then he stopped and he said, that's one way to look at it. And the other way is, we're a part of this whole amazing big scheme. And the more he went down the mountain with that attitude, the more he realized his attitude had changed. 
this idea of emptiness had suddenly become full with a new awareness, a new understanding that, yeah, life is fleeting, life is stressful, but even the ability to recognize when life can be stressful is such a profound gift that to begin to rest with that, to, to, simply lay, to, to simply lean into it, for the Samaritan woman to listen to Jesus as he begins to challenge her own narratives and begins to suggest something else, instead of arguing, she begins to smile. She begins to let go of her own bucket. The story says she runs back to the village and starts to tell others about this person that has helped her discover something about herself. She says, he knows everything about me. He knows more about me that I've discovered. This idea that suddenly the ability to see our limitation and to see past that becomes the gift. I'm going to invite the band to come up. I guess they're already coming on up. There's a wonderful story that um, is told in the Jewish tradition. It's what's called a midrash tale. And it's told about a historical rabbi by the name of Yosef Akiba. And Akiba was a first century Jewish rabbi. He was considered one of the sort of more progressive rabbis of his, of his day, around the time of Jesus. The story goes that Akiba had been in a village teaching, visiting with others in the synagogue, and had made his way back one evening to his own home. But as the night wore on and he was walking, he got a little disoriented. It got dark, and for some reason or other, he momentarily forgot his way home and instead found himself up at the end of a pathway that led to a wall that was part of a Roman enclave. And at the top of the wall were some Roman guards. Akiva was completely lost. He was completely out of sorts, didn't know where he was, certainly not how to get back. And the Roman guard looked down at him and said, who are you and why are you here? And at that, Akiba smiled. And he looked up at the guard and he said, how much do they pay you to stand watch? And the guard said, what are you talking about? He said, how much do they pay you? And he, and he gave him an amount. And then Akiba said, I will give you three times that amount if you will come back with me and wake me up every morning with those same two questions. Who are you and why are you here? And isn't that really what Jesus was telling the Samaritan woman? Isn't that really what he was reminding her? Isn't that what we're really reminded, invited to remember every moment of our lives? To empty that bucket enough to be present, to be a little fearless about acknowledging where our own stories get in the way and then seeing what else is there just a little bit deeper.